um, say that, you know, the title slide, you'll see the authorship is a mix of people on the Viper team and um, people, USGS Flagstaff, who are helping us try to do a somewhat different kind of map. And I think, um, go ahead and go to the next slide. A, a key thing to keep in mind is um, the Viper mission is there to try to understand the volatiles. And the goal of this map is to try to put the volatile observations into a temporal context. And the importance of this is that the hypothesis is that when the volatiles were deposited is likely to tell us a whole lot about how the deposits formed, whether these were ancient ice deposits that are being reworked now, whether volcanism played a role in it, whether the hydrogen we see is um, strongly influenced by solar wind protons coming in, very different ideas have a different idea of how volatiles are distributed in time, and therefore, hopefully we can see that in the rock record. We also want the products to be able to work um, with the other geospatial products um, being used for the mission. But uh, we talked, or we've seen lots of discussion about resources and using the volatiles as resources. And that little graphic there is a diagram of how we would do a resource assessment on the moon um, following USGS methods. And you'll see is that the first step is a descriptive model, which is the processes involved in producing a deposit. And if you don't understand the processes involved, you can do a lot of interesting studies, you can do a lot of statistics, but you add an enormous amount of risk, especially that you might be mixing results from multiple different kinds of deposits, and therefore it's going to be really hard to interpret the statistics uh, with confidence if you don't understand the process. So next slide. So for the mapping itself, the mapping philosophy is very, very classic. I mean, going all the way back to what's generally considered the first geologic map, the William Smith's map of Britain. I mean, that map was produced largely to support finding coal. And that's a lithology, but it was also, what was being realized was it was tied to a certain time period in the geologic history. And so what you're trying to map out are the way different time horizons, isochrons, are interacting with the surface that you can walk around on or access by mining. And so we're trying to stick to that very basic idea of what a geologic map is, um, trying to translate what we see on the surface into ages. Uh, next slide. But it's going to look different than we're used to for most um, geologic mapping here on Earth because there's one primary process, impacts. And this, as we've seen in many of the discussions, this has churned up the rocks. And so the contacts that you classically see between different lithologies are going to be mixed up. And at least with the orbital data we have of this area, you're not going to resolve the little class of different very interesting lithologies and be able to map those out within the breaches. And instead, what's defining the time horizons are the individual impacts and the ejecta, which are essentially instantaneously deposited layers of rock, and then they get mixed up. But um, to try to understand this, uh, unless the impact is very, very recent, it's hard to see the uh, map out the extent of the ejecta from the orbital data, especially for the smaller craters. So we're relying very heavily on cratering models. We see the craters, we know the ejecta had to come out, but their extents are really hard to map visually. So we rely on models to tell us how far out we expect the ejecta to go and how thick we expect the ejecta to be. Next slide. The other thing is that we have concluded that we really need nested maps. The area that we're going to operate in, a few kilometers by a few kilometers, um, that, that's where we really want detailed information. However, there's material from outside the mapping area that's been thrown into the area we're going to be driving around. 
So we really need to worry about things outside that postage stamp of a map that we'll be driving around inside. And the size of the craters that can dump significant amounts of ejecta into the mapping area, um, the, the further away you go, you're interested in just uh, the bigger and bigger craters. So you can ignore smaller and smaller craters as you go out. So nesting the maps um, seems to be essential. Next slide. And so for that most local map, the one that um, is of the area we'll be driving around, we're experimenting. We think we've picked a good number, but we're going to go for one to 5,000, which means we can cover a five by five kilometer area on a one by one meter sheet. Um, we think that's reasonable, but we also have to think about the, the vertical dimension. So the Trident drill and the neutron spectrometer can sense reach down to roughly a meter depth. So we're really interested in what can we see in that top meter. And especially the Trident drill, we're able to control um, what size bites we take uh, and give us a vertical resolution on the order of 10 centimeters. So we're really interested in stratigraphy down to a level of about 10 centimeters in that top meter. So that means, you know, much of the area is probably going to be completely churned up, but any place we might have some intact stratigraphy in that top meter um, with thicknesses of centimeters um, is of particular interest. So that means we're really focused on young craters less than about a billion years because that top meter is going to be churned up and well mixed in, a, in roughly a billion years. So next slide. And so that means what's of immediate importance for intact stratigraphy, it takes a somewhat of a special case for that to survive for us to be able to sample. Um, if you pick a 100 meter diameter crater and say, okay, we wanna see an ejective blanket out to about 10 centimeters thickness, that only goes out you know, several meters, roughly 10 meters. Bigger craters obviously will extend out further and smaller ones are gonna be really confined right around the crater. There's essentially not much stratigraphy we can go after. So we're looking for young craters in that roughly 100 meter-ish um, or, or larger size range. And needless to say, there's not too many of those, um, but that's, that's what can give us stratigraphy that we can sample. Next slide. Two minutes. Okay. Um, and then the context maps, the, so the, as we go out, the, the maps looking at the large areas, we're trying to look at what can dump material into this area. And um, so we're going to go out in steps of five in scale, so one to 25,000, one to 125,000. But we realized that as we want to link out to the big global maps, um, the published one is out there one to five million, it seems critical to have something intermediate in scale, exactly the, the kind of map that uh, Jim just showed us. Um, that seems to be a critical intermediate um, that allows this kind of mapping to tie into the big global picture. Uh, next slide. I'll just show you real quick. This is the one to 5,000 area. Ross Byers counted a bunch of craters. You can see what they look like. Very few of them look especially fresh, but um, we'll probably get as good ages as we can from the morphology and go from there. Um, so running out of time, let's just go through the next ones. Next one, uh, that's jumping up by a factor of five, and that's the Robins at all craters. There's plenty of craters that could have thrown significant material into here, so uh, we can't ignore the context that we're sitting in. Uh, next slide. And that's jumping out with the colors from the global map. As you can see, there, there's a bit of a jump between what we'll be mapping and what's in the global map. It would be really helpful to have something in between in scale. And uh, let's see, I think I have a couple more really quick slides. Um, there are other challenges we're trying to work with. We like to be able to work with people spread out across the country. So we're experimenting with how we can use different cloud services to do the mapping, um, and we want to be interoperable with other 
geospatial products. So we're looking at the databases and the database formats to make sure um, different tools can work with it. And I think the last slide is just a summary. Yep. So we're doing stuff for Viper. I get the impression that a lot of the challenges we're up against are similar to those that Artemis will be facing. And this work really is a bunch of experimenting and collaboration between the Viper team and uh, the folks um, here in Flagstaff, uh, the USGS Planetary Geology Mapping Group. And we're trying to share whatever we learn as efficiently and quickly as we can. Thank you.